toughest. Fastest. Legend. If those words were describing an MMA opponent of mine, I might have to think twice about taking that fight. But fortunately, they weren't. They were words used over the years by people to describe my father, Rick Joslin. I'm going to share with you a story of what it was like to grow up with a man that seemed larger than life. A man whose legacy lives on within me and drives me to inspire the next generation of martial artists. I remember time my brother, my father, and I were at a hockey arena when I was young, and we were about to head home, and we hear someone yell, Rick! My dad turned around, see who called his name, went over and spoke to the gentleman for five minutes. About to head out again, Rick! <laughs> it was the other side of the building some guy wanted to speak with my dad. My dad talked for 10 minutes with this gentleman. I just wanted to get home. I wanted to play video games. I was young. But this would happen four, five, six times on a Sunday. It would often take us an extra hour to get out of the place. This happened every place we went with my dad. Everywhere we went, somebody always knew him, wanted to take his time and talk with him. And I must have made a face or complained one time because my dad grabbed me and pulled me to the side. I said, Jeff, when someone goes out of their way to say hello, that's a very special thing. Always give them your time, give them your attention, and thank them for saying hello. To this day, I still follow that rule. Words and actions, both positive and negative, have tremendous power, especially when they come from someone you look up to. And man, did I look up to my dad. Rick Joslin was a humble man. He never bragged about his accomplishments. He was more about doing the work than talking about it. If I wanted to find out anything about his past, I had to dig through the old, old family photo albums with my mom. And I still love doing that. And I remember we came across a photo of my dad standing in a suit, two professional looking men beside him, and a ring in his hand. And my mom said to me, that was when the mayor of the city gave your father the civic ring. I was like, that's pretty cool. But it was nothing, nothing compared to my favorite photo of my father. Him standing beside two huge trophies, a martial arts uniform on, and the proudest look on his face. My mom told me that was when my dad won the Canadian Karate Championship. And I just stared at this picture every single day. I was just so proud to be Rick Joslin's son. I was just so proud to be a Joslin. Anytime somebody found out my last name, they instantly treated me kinder. If they worked at a store, they would often give me free stuff. That was awesome. <laughs> Nobody picked on me, ever. Equally as cool. I think they were just too afraid of what my dad might do if they picked on me. And it was easy. It was easy for me to imagine myself getting higher grades at school after this guy showed up at parent-teacher interviews. The high level of skill, fitness, and endurance that my father possessed were a result of his laser-like focus, his tenacity, and his unstoppable determination. If Rick Jawson wanted to become great at something, it didn't take long before he was. And I wanted to be great too. And I think my father sensed that as a teenager because he invited me for a jog with him one day. I remember tying my shoe, thinking to myself, this is perfect. I am going to smoke him. So we headed out on the jog. 15 minutes in, my legs were on fire. It was hard to breathe. I glanced over at my dad to see how he was doing. Unfazed. <laughs> they said, Jeff, I'll catch up to you. And he darted off the path to the left, and he went down a, a nearby set of stairs. 500 steps down, 500 steps up. I'm running as fast as I can. He catches up to me, passes me, runs around this huge park in front of us. I get to the park. Huffing and puffing, out of breath, exhausted, he gets to the park, bouncing on his toes, smiling at me. <laughs> and it was at this moment when I realized and truly understood why people say the things they say about my dad. He's the toughest guy they know. He was an absolute machine when it came to cardio training. One of his friends had told me that my dad wore work boots when he went for runs just to make things more challenging. 
He had the fastest hands in Canada when he fought. And my mom told me a story about competitors in his martial arts division pulling out of the tournament and going home when they found out my dad was entering. <laughs> she said that they knew they would be fighting for their lives that day. The man was a real life superhero to me. But let me be clear, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't always this ideal role model type. When he was 18 years old, he was on a bad path. He was in a motorcycle gang, sorry, a motorcycle club, right dad? And he had been arrested a few times. He had spent some time in jail. I don't know how much time he spent in jail because even at 75 years old, he still won't tell me the whole story. But one of the guys in the motorcycle club came up to him and said, hey Rick, I've been taking karate. Why don't you come to class with me tonight? Those 15 words change my father's life forever. 18 months after that very first class, his friend had quit training and my father had earned his black belt in record-setting time. That same year, he opened up a martial arts school where he taught tens of thousands of students over the span of 55 years. When I was a kid, he was just dad to me. When I was 17 years old, he was exactly what I wanted to be, but it just wasn't possible. I figured I would have to accomplish at least half of what he'd done in martial arts to be able to successfully have a chance of running a school in the future, but even half seemed way too much. I didn't like school, and the only job I ever had was cooking hot dogs at our local football stadium where three hours of work felt like a 10-hour grind. I love martial arts, it's all I wanted to do every single day, but my father has set this bar way, way out of my reach. I remember the, the stress was so bad that I broke down into tears while sitting with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, just because of the, the uncertainty of my future. You're teaching kids classes tonight, Jeff. What? I thought my father was joking when he said that to me. I had never taught a class before, but the look in his eyes was inspiring. With my confidence boosted, I agreed to teach that kid's class. And I remember being in the change room, putting on my martial arts uniform, tying my belt, looking in the mirror and thinking to myself, Jeff, you got this. Turns out I didn't have it. The kids almost killed me that first day. I was exhausted after one class of teaching. But my dad gave me many more opportunities over the years, and over time, I became a competent instructor. That success led to many other successes. And over the years, I was able to become a world-class martial artist just like my dad. 25 years after I first put on a martial arts uniform as a small child, I was fighting amongst the world's best in the UFC, the ultimate fighting championship. Six months after my debut fight, everything I had worked for, for my entire life, was taken from me in an instant. I was injured, not in a fight, in training, and forced to retire. I had to rethink my entire life, I had to do what my father had done, transform into a coach, a mentor. I decided to throw 100% of my attention into my teaching and helping my father run a school. I started out by approaching high schools in the city, offering them a self-defense program for their phys ed classes. It became popular. I taught more than 10,000 students over 10 years. I went to the schools to show them that fighting was more cerebral than physical. A fighter didn't have to be loud. A fighter didn't even have to be aggressive. A fighter could be kind, could be approachable, could be soft-spoken. That fact threw off a lot of teachers as well. At the end of the week, I would often grapple and wrestle with the students and spar with them. I would catch them in arm locks. I would catch them in chokeholds and gently, of course. <laughs> and I'd make them tap out and give up. And I would give anybody a chance in the class that wanted to challenge me, come, a chance to come up often defeating 20 or 30 students back to back. It was a lot of fun to 
show them how effective and fun and safe martial arts training can be. I remember I was at a one school and I was up against a European kid who just come to Canada, strong. And the entire class began chanting his country's name, Serbia, Serbia. And every time he said the name, he started fighting me more aggressively. Then I thought, whoa, his friends are cheering him on. Maybe I should let him tie me. Maybe I should let him beat me. Then I thought, nope, and I slapped him in an arm lock and tapped him out. <laughs> And I kind of felt bad because I had beaten him in front of his friends. So I said, come on up. I said, here's a free Jocelyn's t-shirt. <laughs> he did not look happy. <laughs> I figured he was either going to throw it away or burn it completely when he got home. An hour later, I was driving on my lunch break. And I saw the same young man walking down the street, proudly wearing his Jocelyn's t-shirt. What an amazing moment. Today, more than 20 years later, many of those same students are now bringing their children to train with me. This tells me two things. Number one, they enjoyed the training. And number two, I'm getting very old. <laughs> Regardless, it happens. It feels great when it happens. And I had many great memories teaching martial arts with my dad over the years. To see Rick Joslin do his thing, truly inspiring. If you watched him teach a kid's class, and the amount of enthusiasm he had, you would think it was his first week on the job. But he was 40 years in. Jumping around, high-fiving, punching and kicking, smiling from ear to ear, and enjoying every single moment of it. That was the type of teacher I wanted to become. But over the years, I started to lose motivation. Something was missing in my life. It was the pressure. I missed being totally responsible for my successes and my failures. Any time in my life when stakes were highest... I always did my best work. Fighting gave me that. And I needed to feel it again. I came to the realization that I could no longer work for my father. I needed to open up my own martial arts school. It was a tough time. I loved my dad. I would never want to hurt him by leaving his school but I knew he didn't want to retire. This is what he loved to do. He's amazing at what he does. The martial arts school was his baby. But I had two kids and a family to provide for, so I made a promise to myself. I said, before my 40th birthday, I would make my dream become a reality. At age 39, I went for it. I was scared. And excited at the exact same time. I remember sitting with my parents at their dining room table, sharing my ideas, my hopes, my dreams with them. There was a lot of crying, all by me. <laughs> this was a moment that I dreaded for a very long time, a moment that would strengthen my relationship with my father or shatter it completely. My father took a few minutes, and he looked me in the eyes and said, Jeff, you can run my school. If you had told the childhood version of me that I would one day be able to successfully follow in my father's footsteps and carry on his legacy, I would have told you that you were crazy. But my father had just given me my chance. He had bowed out for me. Today at 47 years old, I'm doing my best to inspire the next generation using the same time-tested Rick Jaws and Ways. I teach my class with the same charismatic and magnetic, magnetic energy that he did. I tell jokes, some funny, some not so funny, just like he did. I push people past their limits in an effort to make them stronger, more fit, more confident, just like Rick Joslin did for his students back in the day. And when someone sees me in the street and stops to say hello, I remember my dad's words. I give them my time, my full attention, and I always thank them for saying hi. If I can make a positive impact in the lives of my children and those that I teach, I will be happy at the end of my life. I truly believe that I'm doing so. And to hear the stories is, is amazing. Like my one student, Nate, 
who recently lost more than 75 pounds in his first year of training with us. Or my student, Mel, who worked in policing for many years, came up to me one day and told me that the Kimura shoulder lock I had recently taught her has helped her arrest a man more than twice her size. That was awesome. Or my student, Alicia, a high school teacher, who took her Brazilian jiu-jitsu knowledge and made a class for girls at her school to become more fit, stronger, more confident, all while learning how to kick some butt for a credit. (laughs) Amazing. Now to see my students opening up schools of their own, their students are looking up to them tremendously. Their communities are filled with amazing people. Everybody's having fun. But the training is very, very tough, just like Rick Jocelyn did it back in 1967 from the very start. When I looked up the definition of legacy, I found a great one. Leaving a legacy means giving something that will be valued and treasured by those who survive after your death. I like to think that the Jocelyn legacy can be summarized in three key points. Number one, work harder than people expect. Number two, give people the time of day. Be kind, respectful to everybody you meet. And number three, be passionate. Passion is the strongest force in the world. Find your passion, do it every single day, and shoot for your dreams. Our legacies are not what we say, they are what we do. Our actions set examples which inspire countless others. The good we do lives on long after we're gone. Rick Johnson's legacy and the things he taught me I now proudly pass on to others and feel extremely fortunate and honored to be here standing to share some of that wisdom with you. And Dad, Thank you.